St Mary's Parish Church, Frinton-on-Sea, for our service. Now, I do hope this summer has not been too much of a burden or a drain upon you. We've all had to manage as best we can under the circumstances, but we can take comfort that we can join together in the worship of our Lord Jesus. Here's an opening prayer for us. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. At this point in our service and in our week together, we can take stock of our lives and confess our sins, our weaknesses. We can ask for the Lord to forgive us and give us a fresh start for the week ahead. So let's turn to our Father in heaven and say together, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you. We ask for forgiveness of our sins. We believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose again. Father, we give you our lives to do with as you wish. We want Jesus Christ to fill our hearts and our lives. We wish to have a clean heart in which Jesus can live. We confess our sins to you. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Carol is going to read our poem for us this week. In the Dark by Cathy Hill I was too ashamed to meet him in the day So when evening came, I slipped away But before I saw his face, he was looking into mine And even in the night time I could see him shine I was in the dark until I met the light. My cold, cold heart turned to Jesus Christ. I was in the dark. Still, my eyes could see that even in the dark, he was loving me. The dark is like the night, a life without the Lord, a heart that's filled with sin that God cannot ignore. But when Jesus fills your heart, his light comes shining through. He drives away the darkness 
and will make you new. I was in the dark until I met the light. My cold, cold heart turned to Jesus Christ. I was in the dark. Still, my eyes could see that even in the dark, he was loving me. Thank you, Karen. Time for open prayer. Uh, this week, I want to give you some pictures to look at to stimulate your prayers. Uh, look at each picture and I'll leave you some space to pray about whatever comes to mind for you. To our first picture. Heavenly Father, what does this say to each one of us? We open our hearts and our minds to you, Lord, as we look at this picture. Speak to us, we pray. By your Holy Spirit, come and minister to our hearts and our minds. Father, as we move to the second picture, maybe we think about some of the trials of this life. And again, we say, be with us by your Holy Spirit and inspire us, we pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that we be at one with you, that you would take us wherever the wind of your spirit blows us. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray you continue to be with us, Lord, now and every day as we dwell on you. Amen. It's time for our Bible reading. We are reading from John's Gospel, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. Jesus replies, You are Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know. We testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Amen. Now it's our sermon, and Malcolm has the job of teaching us something today. Nicodemus, from darkness into the light. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Over the past few strange months of lockdown, we've all had more time to think and less opportunity for chat face to face. The telephone's great. FaceTime and Zoom are even better, but nothing quite matches a good chat over a shared meal. How we've all missed these things. Jackie and I have even spent time thinking about fantasy meals with a fantasy guest list. People we would love to share an evening with from history, from society, celebrity, from the Bible. I wonder, who would you like to invite? Would any of us be bold enough to invite Jesus to supper? The menu might be difficult, but the wine would be of the best possible quality. Well, in today's reading, we have a narrative about someone who did the next best thing. Instead of inviting Jesus to dinner, Nicodemus went to see Jesus. Nicodemus. John is the only gospel which mentions this important character. I wonder why. Perhaps it's to do with the fact that the other, the synoptic gospels, appear to be based on a common source or sources, and John used different reference points. John's chronology for parts of Jesus' ministry is also different to the others. He puts the cleansing of the temple at the start of Jesus' ministry, in the previous chapter to this, rather than towards the end, following his Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as the others do. John also was probably one of the closest disciples, if not the closest, the disciple whom Jesus loved. If not, how could he have known of this late night encounter with Nicodemus? Perhaps John was alone with Jesus that night. It's difficult to imagine that the disciples would have left Jesus completely alone, even for one night. So who was Nicodemus and why did John go to the trouble of mentioning him in this passage and twice more further through his gospel? We're told that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, an important one, a leader of the Jews, probably a member of the Sanhedrin, and one of the senior teachers at the temple. He would have been older than Jesus, with a very firm knowledge and understanding of Jewish law. A man of some standing and importance in the temple elite. A man who had spent his whole life examining Jewish law and implementing it in the hope of salvation. So what was he doing, skulking in the dark to visit Jesus at night? Certainly, Jesus' reputation as a teacher would have sparked Nicodemus' interest, and Jesus' recent actions in the temple would have put him on everyone's lips and minds. The other Pharisees had taken against Jesus because he challenged just about everything that they stood for. He challenged their teaching and their lifestyle, their very authority, as well as the uncertain peace with the Romans. However, Nicodemus seems to have been different, a true seeker after truth, as I hope we all are. In verse 2, he acknowledges that Jesus is a teacher come from God. However, he wasn't absolutely sure and given his position, didn't want his fellow Pharisees to find out about his deep interest in what Jesus was talking about. At night he could arrive in secret, and they were less likely to be interrupted by others. What was he doing? He was probably there to gain reassurance from Jesus that what the rabbis were doing and teaching was on the right lines, and if they continued to study and follow all of the law, they would earn themselves a place in the kingdom of God. And he also wanted to know if Jesus was the Messiah, the one they'd all been waiting for. After all, Nicodemus had spent his whole life obeying the minute detail of the law and working to explain it in more and more detail. Few people knew more of the Mishnah than him. He knew what keeping the Sabbath really meant. He knew that he mustn't sew or remove more than two threads from a garment or carry a bedroll. Surely Jesus would be able to tell him that he had nothing to worry about, that he would spend eternity in God's kingdom because he was a good man who kept all the rules. He was in the dark in so many ways. Imagine his shock at Jesus' response. 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. From above, some versions have it. This is the first of the through very truly statements in this brief passage, highlighting the importance that John attaches to what Jesus was saying. Also notice the important phrase, born again. It's so meaningful to us today. And the phrase born again only appears three times in our Bibles, twice in this passage and once in 1 Peter 1, verse 23. We get an idea of how confused Nicodemus was by his response to Jesus. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Oops, is Jesus mad? Nicodemus had spent his life looking for earthly ways to God. What was this Jesus saying? Perhaps the others were right. Perhaps Jesus was mad. But he wasn't sure. Nicodemus was missing the point. Jesus wasn't there to herald an earthly kingdom to come, but a spiritual one. Jesus could see and understand Nicodemus' confusion and went further. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. It's the second very truly statement. What Jesus was doing was using biology to explain his meaning. During pregnancy, the fetus is in the dark, watery world of the womb, alive but limited in its living. Once born, the baby experiences a totally different life, no longer in the dark but in the light, experiencing its first taste of freedom in a new kind of life. It's still the same being, but its experience of life is completely changed. It's much the same way when we are born again spiritually. When we turn to Christ, our whole lives change, our horizons expand and we experience a whole new way of life in him. We become people of light. But, but poor Nicodemus still didn't understand. So Jesus continued. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Poor Nicodemus, still completely in the dark. Even Jesus was beginning to get exasperated. Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? These things are not at all easy. And I doubt that many of us has never been at least a little uncertain as we read our Bibles and look for its meaning. Our faith is nurtured through our experience of God, which comes to us in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We just know that God is with us in our lives, as Jesus describes, a bit like the wind. We feel it and experience its effect on our lives, but we can't see it or touch it. Nicodemus knew that there was something that he was missing, but he was no idea what it was. When we feel like that, we can turn to prayer to build our personal relationship with Jesus. We can turn to scripture to study the word of God and we can try to become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, guiding our daily lives. Jesus didn't give up on Nicodemus, as he doesn't give up on us, however badly we get it wrong. The third, very truly, includes, if I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus was trying to let Nicodemus know that the way to eternal life was not based on earthly feats and functions. It's only available to those who have embraced the Holy Spirit. Jesus' final illustration for Nicodemus was one that he would have known about, as recorded in Numbers 21. Whilst the Israelites were wandering in the desert, they complained to Moses about God, who had brought them out of captivity, apparently only to die of starvation and thirst in the desert. God's response was to send poisonous stakes, and many died. Eventually, the people went back to Moses and repented. So God offered a way for the people to demonstrate their faith. Moses was to make a bronze snake and to fix it to a tall pole. Anybody with faith who was bitten by a snake could look at it and they'd be saved. Look and live.
And although Nicodemus couldn't know what Jesus was referring to, Jesus and his crucifixion, we read later that Nicodemus did have a part to play and that eventually he did come to faith. The last part of this passage is also a bit of a mystery. Were these Jesus' own words or were they added by John? Jesus always referred to the first person of the Trinity as Father, not as God. But really the importance is in the message, not who said it or wrote it. And it's to me one of the most significant sentences in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Everyone who believes in him. You, me, everyone. And I thank God for the day when I realised that I could be one of that glorious number. We all should be thankful. But back to poor Nicodemus. I can't really imagine just how confused he must have been. He had so much to think about following his brief encounter with Jesus. Everything that he'd lived for had been turned upside down. If Jesus did say that last verse to Nicodemus, he even had to contemplate that the Gentiles, the Gentiles would also be welcome in God's eternal kingdom. Perhaps he began to join the dots and link what Jesus had said with the work John the Baptist had been doing. That baptism in water was a symbol of repentance, leading to a spiritual rebirth. That this is a mystery, just like the wind and where it comes from. Certainly something fundamental happened. The next time we hear of Nicodemus is in John 7, 50 to 51, when he is questioning the Sanhedrin as they discuss their plot to get rid of Jesus. He said out loud, our Lord doesn't judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they're doing, does it? They all turned on him and he was no longer able to hide his defence of Jesus. His reputation must have been in shreds. I wonder, are we prepared to stand up courageously for Jesus, as millions are doing throughout our world, even though it might cost them their reputation, their freedom or even their lives? Perhaps it was only when Nicodemus witnessed Jesus' crucifixion that he realised the significance of the snake being lifted up and all the pieces fell into place for him then. His response was absolute. He was in the light, finally. In John 19, 38-42, we read that he went with Joseph of Arimathea, another Jewish secret disciple, to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body and that he provided about a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes to embalm Jesus' body in linen cloths, as, be, as had been the custom when burying a king. Nicodemus had finally come to understand that Jesus was indeed the true Messiah, the King of the Jews, our Lord and our Saviour. Our passage tells the narrative of one man's journey from darkness to light. A journey fraught with confusion, uncertainty and internal conflict, with concern about what others might think or do to that beautiful point in his life where he reached true understanding of acknowledgement that Jesus really is the Son of God, sent to save all who believe in him by faith alone. Faith enables us to trust God with our lives and in so doing, to receive the gift of eternal life, which is being gracefully offered to us by the God who created us, who sent his Son into the world not to judge or condemn us, but to save us for a life which lasts for all eternity. How will we respond to that offer? Nicodemus chose, in spite of the danger and the risks, to come out of the darkness and into the light of Jesus. Will we do the same today? Amen. Thank you, Malcolm. And so to our prayers and our Lord's Prayer, and John will be leading us. Heavenly Father, we have heard and read this morning that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night in secrecy and with stealth. He was timid in his faith and at the start of his journey 
and full of questions. But he came. We are all at different stages of our journey with you, Lord, but we know that you accept us wherever we are on our voyage of discovery with you. We pray that today and every day we would increasingly have our questions answered, that we would grow to know you better, more closely, Lord. Help us not to be like Nicodemus, who seemed earthbound in his thinking, but make us aware of your spirit working in our lives and in the world around us. Enable us to look upwards and be more Christ-like in our thinking and our actions. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for teachers in our schools, for children who are being taught by them. Each child is different. We pray that every child will feel special. We pray for safety in our schools for both staff and pupils. We pray for young people in our churches, Lord, for their parents and those who look after them. We pray for all those whom they look up to, that all children would find positive role models, people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, people who would come alongside them and tell them about you. We pray particularly for anyone today who is feeling isolated, alone, cut off from their friends and family, who is feeling sad and neglected. Heavenly Father, we have been blessed beyond words and whatever we have received in the way of blessings, we are called to share, first with God and then with our neighbour. As we care for ourselves and those immediately around us, our family members, as we receive our pension or another paycheck in the bank, as we fill our shopping bag or prepare our evening meal, let us remember to share. Open our hearts and our hands, Lord, to receive the blessings of generosity by being generous to others. We pray that all of us, young and more elderly, will continue to learn and grow spiritually, that all of us would be surrounded by teachers and tutors, wise people who know you, Lord, and can help us know you better. We know that God sends guidance and understanding if we seek it. We seek it now, Lord, and ask you to sit alongside us. You encourage us, Lord, to be strong and courageous, not to be frightened or dismayed, and that you will be with us wherever we go. Help us, Lord, to break down any barriers that keep us separated from you. Put us on the right track, a new road that will keep us focused on you, whatever happens to us. We want to see you, hear and accept you now, so that we can embrace what you have planned for us both today and throughout eternity, this day but forevermore. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so to our blessing for today, after which will be a closing song of worship. Our blessing is this. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. 
Amen. Stay safe, everyone. See you soon. Blessed be your glorious name. 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 Blessed be your glorious name.